I'm Pete Swift. I'm the chairman of the American Business Council, Kuwait Amsham. Uh, I first would like to thank uh, Paola and Jensen uh, for all the effort of putting all this together and all the last minute scrambling to overcome all the challenges that they had to overcome to make this happen this morning. I'd like to thank our military partners uh, for coming out and taking the time to do this brief for us. This is one of our favorite events. Uh, everyone looks forward to this. We're hoping the next time we're able to come together, we'll be able to do it in person. Uh, we'd like to thank uh, the Bahrain Amsham for their presentation this afternoon. Uh, we'd like to thank uh, our board, uh, my vice chairman, Arzu, and Summer, another member of our team for all their efforts in making this happen. Uh, we are really happy to gather today. Um, as far as uh, the order of precedence, I'll break down how we're going to do things. So uh, what we'll be doing today is uh, going through the presentations by, by the U.S. that will tell you everything you need to know about how to do business uh, with the U.S. military. Uh, from beginning to end. We ask that you please keep your phones on mute. If you have any questions, please type them in the text box. And I'd also like to thank our uh, AMSHAMs around the region, AMSHAM Abu Dhabi, Bahrain, Dubai, Oman, and Qatar for joining us today. And we look forward to having a, a great day and if you registered online uh, with ABCK, you'll be able to share your information directly with the US military. Now, I'd also like to thank our sponsor for today, uh, Venice. Mr. Tom Darren will be uh, speaking. He's the vice president of the Middle East. And I'd like to turn the floor over to him and I'd, I'd like to thank him for their sponsorship today. Um, <clears throat> thank you very much, Pete. I wanna thank you for the opportunity. Uh, I'll get, this will be very brief. I just, uh, will do my pitch so we can get onto what's important. Uh, Venice is a Kuwait company and what we do is uh, we do sponsorships, government relations, construction, warehousing, manpower. Our forte is working with uh, U.S. Uh, defense companies or international defense companies to work and facilitate and shape opportunities with the Kuwait Ministry of Defense, Kuwait National Guard, and the uh, Minister of Interior. Um, <clears throat> so we, we've been doing this now for about 10 years. Uh, and if you need any services in those areas, uh, please feel free to message me and we can get on it. So I'll, like I said, I'll be brief. That's it. And I want to thank everybody for showing up. Really looking forward to uh, this briefing. Thank you very much. Take care. Thank you, Tom. We really appreciate your support and uh, couldn't have come from a nicer guy. Thank you. Uh, well, without further ado, I will turn it over to the U.S. military team down in the room. Thank you, and let's have a great day. Excellent. Well, welcome, everybody, and thank you so much for showing up. Uh, and thank you, uh, all the AmCHAMs, and for ABCK in particular, for hosting <laughs> this event. We're very excited. Um, go ahead and get right into it. There we go. Okay, uh, so introductions. Uh, my name is Major Eric Forsey. I'm a contracting officer, and I work for the Regional Contracting Center in Kuwait. Hello, I'm Nancy Segarra. I'm the procurement analyst for Regional Contracting Center Kuwait. Excellent. And that, that long uh, email address down there, and of course, you will have copies of these slides, so you don't have to write it down now. That is a generic email address that will be, uh, we will be able to check that, and all the contracting officers and specialists in our office will have access to that. All right, our agenda. Uh, this is what we will talk about today, and there will be several presentations my office will present as well as 
uh, representatives from the Air Force as well as the uh, Corps of Engineers, the Army Corps of Engineers. Um, but we're gonna go through these topics. I won't read them off uh, right now because I do talk long sometimes, but uh, we, we are excited to share what we have uh, to offer and hopefully uh, get you interested in doing business with the federal government. That's really the intent of this is to provide information so that we're uh, you know, working together to become better partners. So let's start out with that question. Why do business with the federal government? Why get involved with the federal government in, in, in general? Uh, and to clarify, we all, all do represent all of the presenters here uh, in the military do represent the federal government um, in one capacity, just through different agencies or offices. Um, well, first off, we do a lot of business here. Um, as I'm sure you know, the military is a major buyer. The Department of Defense in general is one of the largest buyers in the world. Um, my office alone last year, uh, Regional Contracting Center in Kuwait, spent just over 41 million uh, US dollars. Um, and that's just one contracting office. The other offices here have their own budgets or have their own customers with their own budgets and, and spend uh, large sums of money as well. There are constantly needs, reoccurring needs, new needs uh, all the time. And we are fair. We, we have fair opportunity, uh, a commitment to fair opportunity and, and treatment of those we do business with, whether we uh, select a company for award or otherwise. Uh, we, we can guarantee that. Um, if we don't have any past perform uh, performance, we're not going to judge that against you. We, we can't actually, by law, we have to consider you neutral. So there's not a lot of barriers to entry into doing business with the federal government uh, up front. It, it may seem complex. There may be systems to register in, but once you're in, um, there is never any pay to play. Uh, other than putting together the cost of a proposal, Really, uh, there's no registration fees, no entrance fees, no membership costs. There is no cost to do business with the federal government other than the cost of business. Um, and that's something that we also guarantee and we'll never ask for that. And, uh, yeah, so the requirements come in all different types and sizes, um, large quantities, small quantities. Uh, and we would encourage anybody to compete for what they're willing to or what they can compete for, what, what their businesses can can provide. Um, so there's there's lots of, of ramps on ramps into doing business with the federal government. Um, and we encourage you to, to get involved and to use that process to sharpen your skills and to better your possibilities or your, your probabilities of success in the future. Because it is a learning process, but there's, there's lots of good reasons to get in there. Now let's talk about my office and what we do for just a little bit. Um, again, I represent myself and Nancy here, represent the Regional Contracting Center in Kuwait, or the RCCKU. So the Regional Contracting Center in Kuwait, we buy lots of types of supplies and services in support of the uh, US Army Central Command, or RCENT, and the forces, those forces located within the state of Kuwait, uh, within Kuwait uh, and really only Kuwait. That's what my office takes care of. So these forces, these are our customers. These are the people that we represent, the contracting officers and the specialists that work for my office. Uh, we have a mandate uh, from those who employ us in the federal government to ensure that the American taxpayers are getting the best value for their goods and services and that our customers' needs are being met. Um, so that, that is our, our job. Uh, those customers are located across Kuwait, mostly Camp Arif John, uh, but also Camp uh, Buring and uh, Kabari Crossing and a few other locations as well. And we work hard to meet our customers' needs uh, while ensuring that contractors receive fair, impartial and equitable treatment. I've already talked about that a little bit and I'll talk about it a bit more here. Um, but what we are not, my office in particular, uh, we do not deal with what we call external support contracts. Contracts that are, are large and do large base support operations. And yes, we do buy a lot, but those large base support operation contracts that have been in place for a long time and will continue after uh, I leave, um, log cap, that logistics civilian augmentation program contract, the, the heavy lift eight contract, that contract that deals with transportation and large scales and uh, um, scales and quantities, that, that is not contract. Those are not contracts that my, offer, uh, my office administers. And of course, we're not the core of engineers. They are here and they will present later. So what does it mean to be uh, impartial, fair, and equitable? 
Uh, first and foremost, impartial means we can't show favoritism. Uh, we rely on competition to drive a lot of what we do. We think that it's very, very important. Um, we can be friendly. We can be very friendly with people. We just can't be more friendly with one vendor or, or contractor than another because that can create a, a perception of favoritism, which could impair our ability to have uh, free and open competition to the greatest extent. And this is why uh, we can't accept gifts um, from contractors or from, from offers. Um, we can't give out information that would give one contractor an unfair competitive advantage over another. Uh, and we always document our conversations and we strive to be as transparent as possible during a solicitation process and during execution of a contract. Um, like I said, favoritism drives so much of what we do, we, we really strive to protect it. Uh, fairness, uh, when we talk about fairness, we talk about how we treat those we do business with. Um, we treat uh, our, our vendors with respect in accordance with the objective terms of the solicitation or the contract. Um, objectivity is very important. We, we strive to adhere to that so that we're not uh, subjectively making decisions. Sometimes we have to make determinations and the contracting officers in my office are, are qualified and um, authorized to do that, but we try to keep it as objective as possible. We know you work hard you know, and we strive to make sure your proposals are reviewed the same way. We're going to show everybody the same amount of fairness when we read your proposals. We're going to evaluate them the same way. And during execution, we're going to listen to your concerns uh, and, and make sure that, that we are keeping ourselves to the same standards um, that we are holding you to. Uh, if you have a contract with us and you feel that you're being treated unfairly or during the solicitation process, we encourage you to speak up about that. And equitable, uh, this means really the balanced nature of a contract. Um, when I talk about uh, equitable in, in a contract uh, sense, think uh, we like to think of a contract upon award as being perfectly balanced between the buyer and the seller. Uh, we all know that there are times when the contract will get out of balance. And uh, during those times, we, we strive to put it back into balance. And that could be adjusting the terms on either the buyer or the seller's end. Um, but it is our job to make those determinations and to maintain that balance as best as possible throughout execution through completion. All right, now a little bit, of, a little bit about what we actually buy. Um, I referenced that a little bit before. And this slide just shows a brief overview uh, of the things that we know we normally buy the things and the services and we do buy commodities and tangible goods, as well as services. Um, for commodities, we, we what we're talking about there are office furniture appliances sometimes generators. Um, of course, building materials uh, gravel uh, for services, we have had needs and have current needs that we have on contract uh, for custodial services, uh, medical and dental services, um, maintenance, landscape maintenance, equipment maintenance, those types of requirements. And for construction, which is the other thing that we do, we, we do have contracts for minor construction. Um, major construction is handled by the Army Corps of Eng Engineers, but my office also does uh, maintain contracts for minor construction. We have the occasional requirement for that. Uh, road repair, uh, some carpentry. Um, we've, we've used construction contracts to build sunshades in the past, things of that nature. Those are all fairly common. I'm going to talk about a little bit about uh, the, the people that work in my office, not by name, but by role and, uh, and job description or responsibility. These are the people that you'll work with quite often uh, during the solicitation and during execution of a contract. First up, the contracting officer. Contracting officers is the only person who is authorized to sign a contract uh, and to obligate taxpayer funding, US uh, taxpayer funding. That's where all of our money comes from. So uh, the only person who can actually put money onto a contract and to guarantee that it's gonna be paid after services or goods are, are received. Um, we're the only ones, contracting officers, the only ones who can change a contract change the terms or conditions of that contract that would uh, be a deviation from, from the scope um, from what that contract was originally for and anything definitely that will reflect a change in price or cost. We're the only ones who can terminate a contract. 
And we're the only ones who can direct a contractor to do something outside of the scope. Just the contracting officer, not the contracting specialist, not the core, not the PM, or any of these other roles you may work with. Now, the contracting officer is the one who signs. The contracting specialist is the one who does a lot of the work. Um, they will work very hard during the solicitation phase. Uh, they will work with our customers internally to help uh, define the requirement and to help put out the, the solicitation and, and to evaluate the solicitation during execution. They're the ones who are primarily administering this contract. Um, we also uh, like to think of them as, as just basically being the, the workhorses for us, uh, for contracting officers. We rely on them heavily to, to do a lot of the day-to-day -day interface from an administrative perspective with the, with the vendors and the customer or the contractors that we work with. Contracting officers representatives represent the contracting officer, but from a technical or from a programmatic perspective. Uh, so they, they are authorized in writing. They have explicit uh, responsibilities, written responsibilities and um, uh, authorities to, uh, to represent us and to surveil, to monitor the work throughout completion. We like to think, them, think of them as the eyes and the ears of the contracting officer where we can't be there, they are. Um, they will work most directly with vendors and contractors on service contracts, mostly uh, during that execution to, con uh, to confirm that the, the service is conforming to the terms and conditions. Uh, they may provide some of that surveillance uh, and evaluation during a past performance uh, evaluation period. And it is important to note that not every contract will have a contracting officer's representative only contracts that need one will have it. Uh, and most service contracts that we let will have a contracting officer's representative. All right, that's some of the upfront business about what we do, why we do it, and why we're interested in getting more people interested in us. Uh, now, what type of systems, what are the processes that you need to do to actually go down that path? Well, we do know, we all know there's lots of systems. When I said that there's not a lot of barriers to entry, that's true, generally speaking, once you're, once you're crossed to that threshold, once you've entered into these systems, then it's just maintaining them. And there's no cost associated with any of these, just the, the requirement to learn them. I'm not gonna go into depth, and that's not the intent of this, of this briefing, to go into depth to explain that process, but this does cover uh, these systems and the, and the steps you would have to take in order to become a vendor that could do business with the federal government. Uh, up front, right up front, uh, you will have to register in a, through a system um, to get a, a NATO commercial and government entity code uh, or an NCAGE. And we can provide links to all of these sites. Um, I can do that through, through the ABCK. Uh, but the, the NCAGE, uh, is, is simply tied to the physical address of your, of your company's facility, of your headquarters office. Um, you'll also require to register through Dun & Bradstreet, uh, another website to get a Dun's number. Um, this has to do with the credit rating and credit worthiness of your company. Um, and, and you'll note here, I'm putting some of the time frames for how long it will take to get registered and to provide or to get the, the feedback that you'll need to move on to the next steps. And that's to, to emphasize that it takes time to do this. And the time to register is, is now, it's not when a solicitation comes out because then you may not have enough time um, for these systems to process in order to submit a solicitation or a proposal. Uh, after a DUNS number and NCAGE is acquired, uh, you can go into the System Forward Management, SAM. This is a website the government, US federal government uses for lots of interface with vendors and contractors. Um, and this is where uh, you would create a profile, enter this, the, your NCAGE and your DUNS number, uh, and to register your business. This is, a, this is a formal registration to do business with the federal government. Uh, make sure, please make sure, assure when you do this, that you enter your company exactly as, as it's legally defined, both in terms of the address and in terms of the spelling. Um, this system is a system of record for us that will uh, feed into other business systems that we use. Uh, so however you enter your company's name, that's how it's gonna appear uh, the rest of the time you do business with the federal government. Mistakes will follow along. You can correct them, but it, it can create issues. Uh, so we do, we do ask that you be extra careful there. Uh, you'll register a, a NAICS code, a North American Industry Classification System. This is simply a code 
which uh, describes what it is your company does um, in, a, in a broad category that helps us categorize you uh, and your, your businesses when we're doing solicitations. And, and of course, that last step there, representations and certifications or reps and certs, as we commonly refer to them as, you'll, you will complete these and you will, you will register or, I'm sorry, renew these on an annual basis. Reps and certs are a broad category of descriptions for what your company is and what you do, and their certifications guaranteeing certain things to the federal government um, so that we can uh, answer broad questions all at once as opposed to going back to you over and over and over again in solicitations. And registration is good for one year, but like I said, once you're in, it's just maintaining that. Uh, that last system, JCCS or JAGS, this is a, uh, a regional requirement uh, in addition to these others. Um, and it's for, for those companies that are the non-US based. Uh, registration involves uh, creating a profile and answering some, answering some questionnaires. Uh, and this is one of the last steps. Uh, there is an action on both, both uh, the, the, uh, the contractor as well as the government in terms of creating this and then it being reviewed by a government official. Uh, again, it does take time, and we do ask that you, you work on all of these now if you have any interest. There is no cost to any of these systems. It just takes time and to, to figure them out. And once you're in, you're in. Um, we will only solicit to vendors who are registered, and that's important. I'll talk about that later. Uh, and finally, white area workflow. This is how we pay. This is how we pay. Almost all of our, our contracts will be paid through electronic fund transfer, and it will flow through. Uh, the wide area workflow uh, module, which is a part of a larger government uh, website, but it's, it's a registration again, and then it's watching some user videos on how to submit invoices, how to submit receiving reports, uh, cost vouchers, things of that nature. How to read our solicitations and contracts. The good news is most of our solicitations and contracts follow a standardized format or a very similar format. So once you've, you've read one or you've viewed one, you've, you've seen a lot probably, and you can continue to use that knowledge as you go forward. We do use a lot of forms. SF stands for Standard Form and DD stands for Department of Defense. Um, we do use uh, some forms that are uh, reoccurring, uh, SF 1442s. I've got the examples of a DD, a Department of Defense Form 1155, all that. To, all that to say is you'll see these numbers appear a lot. Um, my office mostly uses uh, an SF-1449, which is a, a form that we use for commercial contracts and solicitations. Um, it's really just a couple of pages. Uh, there's a SF-1449 down there in the left corner, um, followed by lots of free text. But the, 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 the Pages up front are always going to be the same. They'll always look the same. I do have one corner called out there. Um, there is important information on these slide or on these uh, these upfront forms. Uh, for instance, they will have the solicitation issue date and the due date on uh, the offer and time. But if you read through the rest of the solicitation, it will have all of the other instructions. And I'll talk about that as well. The nice thing about these forms is that they uh, will flow over nicely into a contract. So if we use it as a solicitation, um, and it's time to award it, it converts very nicely into a contract. It doesn't look like anything you haven't seen before. Uh, the pages that follow the, the upfront forms are gonna have all of the additional information and they will generally be in the same format. Um, for commercial contracts, it's, it's gonna be uh, roughly what's seen right here, those, those clause numbers, 52, that's, a, that's a, uh, the beginning of a, of a standard clause numbering system that we use. Um, and, and right up front there, contract line items or contract line item numbers, CLINs, you may have heard that term. Um, we will always describe what we're buying through contract line item numbers. And we're gonna talk about it in terms of unit of issue, unit price, uh, required quantities, and total price. And our solicitations will leave the pricing information blank uh, to allow the vendors the offerers uh, to insert that, that unit price and that extended price. In the contract, obviously, it will be the awarded value uh, of those you know, final agreed upon numbers. Uh, we'll have instructions to offerers. That's that clause number ending in uh, our 52212-1. 
This is going to tell uh, vendors and offers how to submit. Uh, what's the time limits? Uh, when are questions due? Um, you know, what is the what is the web address? If we're going to take a, a email address to receive solicitations, will we will we accept paper solicitations? All of that information is going to be in that clause um, or provision. The evaluation information that's going to be in that 52 uh, 212-2 clause. This is going to tell vendors and offers what the proposal will be evaluated against. What rules are going to govern the evaluation of this proposal? Um, it will also uh, tell the vendors what factors we're going to look at, price or technical. Are we going to look at price more important than technical? Uh, and if so, if, the, if we're going to weight one factor over, number, uh, over another, by how much are we going to look at past performance? Um, always look for salient characteristics or the, the, the descriptions of the services and supplies that we are buying. Uh, we'll define it in a couple of places, but this is the most important characteristics that we are trying to uh, ensure that offers understand as they put together their proposals. For service contracts, there's going to be a performance work statement or a statement of work. We use performance work statements a whole lot, um, not much different uh, than a statement of work. It just describes the objectives that we're going after as opposed to describing in detail what we're buying. Um, but it tells the officers and the contractors the performance objectives or requirements, uh, how often, you know, by, uh, by what quantities, what dates, what, what's the standard of the service we're looking for. And it may provide detail on recording, uh, reporting requirements as well. And finally, that commercial terms and conditions clause, this will be in almost every one of our commercial contracts, 52.212-4. I'll flip the slide here. This is gonna have a lot of information, uh, this one clause. And uh, it's designed that way to be used over and over again so that we don't have to, we the government don't have to recreate these, these requirements, these terms and conditions over and over again. Uh, this is just a few of the items listed in this clause to give you an example. It'll talk about the warranties that we uh, require that contractors are signing up for when they sign uh, solicitation or, or contracts with the, with the federal government. Um, contract changes, how, how, how should the contract be changed? Uh, it's inspection and acceptance requirements, uh, excusable delays, termination, those are just a few of the, of, the, of the elements that are listed in there. So it is a very important clause to read. Uh, a few of the other clauses that we like to remind people about, um, 52.212-5, this is going to incorporate a lot of US, United States rules and regulations that we have to include in contracts by law. Um, so it, it's, it's basically a checklist where we go down and we mark certain things that will be required, um, that we are required to put in contracts. Uh, commercial representations and certifications, uh, this is required in solicitations. Uh, again, if, you've, if you're registered in SAM and you're current and it's accurate, all you have to do uh, to answer this requirement is to state no changes uh, the, or to go in and, and to modify um, what has changed and what should be changed by answering all of the clause questions. Um, the other reps and certs to take note of that we remind people of, um, 52204-26, this is an important requirement. It's relatively new for us. It talks about covered telecommunications, in particular, prohibited telecommunications on video surveillance equipment. And it's important because this clause, uh, you would answer this in your reps and certs as a part of your annual reps and certs. Uh, the, the intent of this is not to um, discuss or to determine whether or not vendors provide telecommunications or video surveillance equipment, but whether or not they provide or offer or use prohibited stuff that the United States federal government would, would consider prohibited telecommunications. Um, and mostly for reference, those are, uh, those are things created by um, uh, like Huawei, for instance, or ZTE. There's nothing wrong with these products. We just take a certain interest in them as, a federal, as the, the federal buying entity. Uh, and then 52204-25, that would be unique to the solicitation itself and for the thing that we are buying, the good of the service. So the first one is, do you do it generally? And the second one is, do you offer it or do you include it in your, in your solicit or in your uh, proposal um, and, and what you will be providing in execution? Um, 52222-50, this refers to or addresses combating and uh, trafficking in persons. Um, this, this is really uh, making sure that 
everybody understands what the rules are requiring um, compliance with host nation labor standards or the United States uh, labor standards and the treatment of employees. Uh, and then that last one right there, it's a, a long numbered clause ending in 7995. This has to do with a system, well, it really has to do with doing business with the federal government within uh, the GCC region, the, the CENTCOM area of operations. Uh, and, and particularly when services are being performed, uh, it, it requires registration in a system. It's called the Synchronized Pre-Deployment and Operational Tracker, but it's only when it's applicable. So it's only applicable if you're uh, bringing in employees who are moving around the area, transitioning through a deployment center, or who would require a letter of authorization to access services uh, on a U.S. installation. If, if it doesn't the employees that, that you have working on a contract with the federal government don't apply for those particular uh, areas. It's not applicable to you. There's nothing to be done other than to read the other requirements in that clause. All right, I was asked specifically to include this slide right, slide right here because I'm aware that there are lots of, um, or at least the occasional uh, fake uh, government requirement or government contract. And we wanna make sure that everybody understands what uh, what we do and what we don't do so that you don't get scammed. Um, the U.S. government, I, I, again, I can't reiterate this enough, we will never require any type of entrance fee, registration fee, uh, uh, membership fee. There is no such thing. So please do not fall victim to that. If somebody offers you a pay to play, you know, pay us a, a fee and we will get you in with the federal government. That is not sanctioned by us. Uh, the U.S. government will never communicate through non-official email accounts. Um, so we will never have a domain name ending in gmail.com, yahoo.com. Uh, all of our email accounts will end in .mil, .mil, or .gov, .gov. Um, there's an example right there. Um, that is the, the only way we will communicate official business. Uh, we do not ever, or generally almost never, offer advanced payment. Um, so uh, if you hear terms or conditions from, from vendor or from other entities saying that they are the federal government uh, that, that offer advanced payment, question it. And always question if you feel any reason to question by reaching out to the individuals listed in the email. Pick up the phone, call them, and email them, um, and, and make sure that they're a real person representing the federal government. How to respond to opportunities. All right, uh, first and foremost, make sure you understand the requirement, make sure you understand how to answer the requirement in a solicitation. Uh, uh, you know, the five W's, in particular the what and the when and the where of that supply and service. Answer the questions that we're asking because that gives us an idea of what you'll be able to provide uh, and, and, and if you're answering again, those evaluation criteria that we, that we listed up front, because that's how we're going to objectively measure your proposal. Um, the solicitation will require, uh, our work work will contain required product and service specifications, characteristics or technical data. Um, make sure you address anything that we call out in this solicitation by telling us how you intend to meet that requirement or to solve that problem. Uh, definitely pay special uh, attention to the instructions and the evaluation criteria. Um, and, and the timeliness is, is a very important element of that. Make sure you're on time. Be on time. Uh, if, you, if your offer is late, we have no requirement to accept it and, and we will generally not. Um, follow the instructions that are listed. Uh, there's nothing worse than having a, a great proposal that is not compliant with the requirements. And we talk about, you know, being fair to all offers. Um, if we if we said your, your proposal must include a certain element and it does not, we're, we're, we're going to eliminate it from competition. Um, provide everything that is asked for. Uh, ask questions early. There's going to be questions that you will have. Uh, most proposals, almost all proposals or solicitations for proposals will have a, a deadline for when you can ask questions. Um, we're going to do really uh, our best to make sure those questions are publicized if we're emailing you or if they're on a website. We'll address it through that website. 
and, and make sure everybody has fair access to the answers. Um, get registered in the systems that I already read, uh, mentioned. The time to do that is now and not when a solicitation is, um, is out, something that, that you could propose to because it may take too much time and you will be otherwise un, uh, un, uh, unable for us to do business with. All right, I'll turn it over to Nancy. All right, great. So um, once you get registered and you respond to a solicitation and hopefully you get a contract, once you get a contract, what are our, the US government's expectations of the contractor? And I'm just gonna touch on a few key things here. The first thing I wanna to touch upon is the Defense Base Act insurance requirement, the DBA insurance requirement. Um, what DBA insurance is, I don't know if you're familiar with the term of um, workers' compensation. It's a type of workers' compensation disability type insurance that provides medical and death benefits to covered employees in the unfortunate incident that um, one of your employees are injured or dies uh, during the performance of the contract. Um, not all contracts require DBA insurance. Most of the contracts that do require DBA are um, service contracts and construction contracts that are performed on, uh, performed on military installations. Um, also, please note that uh, Department of Labor website there, the insurance must be provided by an approved insurance carrier. If it is not, you will not be reimbursed for your uh, DBA insurance, basically. So please check out that website for who the um, approved carriers are. And also that Department of Labor website has more insurance on exactly what Defense, Defense Base Act insurance is. So what will happen is this, if DBA is required, the solicitation will let you know that DBA is required and you will have an opportunity to provide an estimated cost of what that insurance is going to be. Once you are awarded the contract, you wanna go ahead and purchase that DBA insurance right away because we will require the proof of insurance from you before performance of work can even begin. Okay, so it's very important, provide a uh, purchase that insurance right away and provide proof to the government that you have that insurance. And then once, uh, once the contract has been performed, you will have the opportunity to be reimbursed for the actual cost of that DBA insurance. Um, in order to be reimbursed, you wanna make sure that you keep your receipt of payment and that receipt is stamped paid because if the finance office does not see a paid stamp on it, they will not accept it and they will not reimburse it. All right, so let's talk about uh, contract payments for a little bit. Um, first of all, as Major Forsey had mentioned earlier, uh, we do not prepay for services or supplies, so you will not get an advance payment. Um, we pay for supplies and services after they are received, after they are performed, um, and after the goods and services have been accepted by the requiring activity. Uh, we use the wide area workflow, which has been previously mentioned uh, for the invoicing and payment, invoicing acceptance and payment of invoices. And we make payments by electric, electronic funds transfer. Um, what will happen is when you submit your invoice through the wide area workflow, you will be at that time required to put your EFT banking information in at the same time. Um, it does take invoices up to 30 days for payment, but please note that this 30 days is upon receipt of a proper invoice. And we're gonna talk a little bit about um, what an improper invoice looks like. Um, so to avoid delays, you just wanna make sure that your invoice is submitted in accordance with the contract. There is a wide area workflow clause that happens on every contract and it will give you the instructions on how to submit an invoice and the types of information that you need to put in there. But it's very important that you follow the instructions because if you don't, it could cause delays in payment. Um, I do also want to mention the fact that the government will pay in the local currency of which your company is registered. So if you're a Kuwaiti uh, registered company, you're going to be paid in 
uh, Kuwaiti dinar. Um, Iraqi companies will be paid in Iraqi dinar, so on and so forth. The only countries currently that have an exception are the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and um, Syria. But all other countries are going to be paid in the local currency for which they are registered. Also, please note that when you provide your proposal, uh, you will provide the proposal at the exchange rate of, of the time that you're submitting your proposal. But please note that when you are paid, you are going to be paid at the exchange rate of the payment date. All right, so now I wanna talk a little bit about the common errors that cause the delays in payments. Okay, so um, the submission that you put into wide area workflow, that is considered your invoice. So we ask you not to submit any extra attachments. I know each company tends to have, you know, their own personal like paper or electronic type invoices and you like to submit that as an attachment to your invoice. Please do not do so because what will happen is if there's anything on that attachment that does not match the contract or your WAF submittal, like an address or or anything, um, a, a quantity or anything, it will cause the payment office to reject that invoice. So the only time we would like for you to submit any extra attachments is if you're trying to get reimbursed for DBA insurance. And in that case, you must attach the paid stamped receipt to show what your actual payment was for DBA insurance. Um, please ensure that when you submit your WAF invoice, everything matches the contract. The address must, the address name, the address number, the address city, everything must match. The unit of issue must match. Um, so, um, oh, and then the unit price must match. If there are any mismatches, that's going to cause a payment rejection. Another common error that we tend to see is if you submit to the incorrect DODAC. The DODAC is the Department of Defense Activity Address Code, and there is a DODAC code for the issuing office, the administering office, the payment office, the, and the acceptance office, and the delivery location. The WAF clause that goes onto the contract is going to have all of those uh, particular codes, and you want to make sure that you enter them correctly when you submit your invoice. Uh, what's really important is if you get the acceptor DODAC incorrect, the person who was supposed to accept the services and contracts are never going to see that invoice in order to be able to accept the uh, goods and services. Um, and therefore, uh, if it's not accepted, it's not going to get paid. Um, one other thing I really want to point out that's a common error is the shipment date on the WAF invoice. So you'll have an invoice submit date, which could be any date that you submit the invoice, but the shipment date needs to be the date that the performance occurred or that the delivery occurred, okay? And that shipment date must be on the date of delivery or before the date of delivery. If that shipment date occurs after the delivery date on the contract, the, the, the invoice will be rejected. Now we know that there are some instances when uh, the shipment date might occur late. And in that case, you need to contact Contract, um, you need to contact the contracting office to do a contract modification. Um, and then please, please make sure that your EFT information is on the invoice that can also cause a rejection. The final thing that I wanna really point out is how to achieve positive past performance once you are performing on a contract. We use a system called the Contractor Performance Assessment Reporting System or otherwise known as CP. PARS, um, and that's how we document performance on a, officially document performance on a contract. Not every contract re requires a formal evaluation, right? In most cases, it is going to be service and, con uh, service and construction contracts over $250,000 or supplies over a million dollars. But just because your contract doesn't require a formal evaluation, you want to make sure that uh, you have good performance anyways, right? Because that leaves an impression on the contracting officer and the contracting specialist and the contracting officer representatives that you're working with. 
Um, please note that if you do everything that the contract states, just as it is stated, that warrants you a satisfactory contract rating. Okay, and it's not bad to have just a satisfactory contract rating, right? Um, if you want to do any, if you want to get a rating that's higher than satisfactory, you kind of have to do certain things um, above and beyond uh, what the contract requires. Um, one thing that I do want to actually ask you guys is that if you do feel like you you do perform above and beyond what the contract requires, please uh, uh, keep documentation of such performance because what will happen is when we do our rating for you, you will have the opportunity to provide a response to our rating. So let's say we give you a satisfactory rating and you feel like you deserve uh, an exceptional rating, then you this will be your opportunity to provide that kind of documentation of what you felt you did above and beyond the level of the contract. Again, if you do everything as in accordance with the contract, it's satisfactory. And again, you know, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. A satisfactory rating is, um, you know, is going to get you is going to get you contracts as well. Um, one thing is, you know, sometimes mistakes happen on contracts and uh, one mistake is not going to necessarily mean that you're going to get an unsatisfactory rating. You just have to make sure that when mistakes occur, that you're very timely and prompt in helping to resolve those situations. Those are the only things that I wanted to really point out as far as what we expect from you. Um, at this time, this concludes what RCCKU has to present. I just want to remind you that we're going to uh, you're, we're going to address your questions via the chat function, um, and we're going to address those at the end of the presentations. And at this time, we will turn it over to the next presenters. Thank you. Okay. Now we're going to move on to the next presentation from the U.S. Air Force. Uh, good morning. Um, thank you guys all for being here. My name is Tech Sergeant Sheba Marie Wynn. I am the Infrastructure Flight Chief uh, representing 386 Econs, and I'm also a Warranted Contracting Officer. So starting off with our brief, uh, I'm just going to go over exactly who we are as 386 Econs. I'm going to go over my slide, which is the construction team, and then I have my counterparts who are going to talk about the services team and the government purchase card program. And lastly, why, uh, why we encourage you to do business with the US government. So who we are. As far as who we are, we represent the 386 Expeditionary Contracting Squadron, who directly supports the 386 Air Expeditionary Wing. Uh, we have 16 people in, on our team. As I mentioned, we have quite a few disciplines. We go over commodities, services, and construction. And then we also have a government purchase card uh, purchasing program. We support Ali Aslam Air Base, Al Hamad Al Jabbar Air Base, and also Cargo City. Our GPC team's actions range up to thirty-five thousand U.S. dollars, and overall, uh, as far as contracting goes, we spend about fifty-five million dollars a year. As far as construction goes, I'm going to be going over typical team projects, current awarded contracts, and upcoming opportunities. As far as typical projects go, uh, as you can see here, I've listed out quite a few of them. Uh, it's pretty straightforward. So for utility infrastructure, we do kind of electrical work, sewer sewage treatments. For pavement, we have airfield, runway, taxi repairs, parking, uh, road repairs such as asphalt and gravel, facility construction repairs like building buildings and pre-engineered buildings. We also do things like HVAC repair replacements and sunshades. So very similar to what the Army does. Um, just on the Air Force installation. As far as awards that we've made recently, I'm sharing this with you just to show you the opportunities that other vendors here locally have been able to achieve. And so it kind of give you an idea of what you two can look forward to. So a couple of awards that we've done are construct new brownstone dorms. So we constructed about eight new living quarters with 26 rooms each that came out to be 2.1 million dinar. We did a repair of runway contract that required 33,000 tons of asphalt to repair a portion of our runway. It was valued about 1.4 million dinar. We did a renovation for a building that came out to be 154,000 dinar, and that included hardening exteriors, electrical system repairs, and HVAC repair. And then lastly, we also had a new fire station built that came out to 392,000 dinar. And that was uh, essentially a 15,000 square foot concrete masonry fire station. 
So before I can move forward with as far as like upcoming opportunities, I want to go over a couple of award types and uh, contracting terms, just so we're, we're kind of understanding where I'm coming from. So the first time I want to go over is standalone contracts. So a standalone contract is a simple award for single service or commodities. Uh, a lot of these are going to see are for commodity requirements um, that a commodity team does. Uh, as far as construction goes, we will, we don't really do too many standalone because we do uh, rely a lot on IDIQs and task orders off of those IDIQs. As far as IDIQs, that stands for indefinite delivery, indefinite quantity, uh, which just means a specified period and contract amount. Um, we usually award it to either a single award or multiple award contracts, um, which would come to the term multiple award IDIQs which is just a group of companies or contractors that essentially will compete for our construction projects. An example of this is our MAC, which stands for a multiple award construction contract. We do have one with the 386, and currently we have about five contractors on that. Off of our IDAQs, the way that we put orders in is through a task order, which are a direct result of an award made under an IDIQ contract. And the last term I want to go over is BPA, which stands for Blanket Purchase Agreement. It's very similar to a contract, but rather than a contract, it's an agreement. So both parties at, at any point can actually uh, cancel on that agreement. Uh, these terms are all really important because these are things that you're going to hear from us as far as when we're soliciting. We're either going to be soliciting for a standalone contract, possibly an IDAQ, or possibly a BPA. As far as upcoming opportunities, uh, these are just a few of our bigger ones. Uh, the first one is our airfield paving IDIQ. We currently have two contracts on that and it's going for one year plus one year options. This one is set to expire in fiscal year 2023. And we expect the solicitations to come around April or March of 2023 with a period of performance of that following September. Then we have the multiple award construction contract, which I mentioned has about five contractors on it. This one runs for one year plus four one-year options, set to expire in a fiscal year 2025. We expect the solicitation to come out about March, April of 2025 with a period of performance starting that September. Next one is the base paving IDAQ, which we have three contractors on, which runs for one year plus, one, plus four one-year options set to expire in FY 2025. And then those solicitations also come out March of April of 2025. And lastly, we have a demolition BPA. Uh, unlike IDIQs, at any point, those could be canceled. But if they run the test of time of five years, that would expire in fiscal year 2026. So as you notice on the bottom of the slide, I put a couple of notes as far as some of the terms that I brought up. When I speak of options, that's just a set period of additional time from the one year mark. So if we have a one year contract, there's an option to extend for up to two, three, four years after that. And then as far as fiscal years, the US government runs on fiscal years and ours runs from one October to 30 September of that year. So instead of calendar years, we would reference fiscal years. And then POP, as you see on there, is this period of performance. So how to get on an IDIQ. So I'm sure a lot of you want to do business with us and so we want to make sure that we're giving you the tools and the information to how to do that. So the first one is knowing when the IDIQs expire, which is why I gave you that information. Um, second one is building up your experience. So gain experience through either standalone contracts, whether it's through commodities or service. Um, and this is very important because when we do the larger contracts like IDIQs, a lot of that is based on past performance, right? We're looking to see what you've done with the US government and how you performed. So getting on those smaller contracts really benefits you. The third one is submit your capability statement. Right? We want to know who's out there and what uh, capabilities you have so we can do business with you. This would greatly uh, help you for those standalone contracts when we're looking through who submitted their capabilities and who we can do business with. The fourth one is respond to requests for information and attend other vendor days. So opportunities like this are really helpful because this is where we advertise our bigger projects. We also tend to do vendor days for our larger contracts like Mac. So if you receive that invitation, we highly encourage you to come. And lastly, respond to solicitations with their nouns. And just mention, right, uh, make sure that you submit on time and then you show us that you understand the requirement and that you are willing to work with us.
So with that, I'm going to pass the second half of this briefing to the services team. Hello, I'm Staff Sergeant Michael Roybal. I am one of the warrant contracting officers on our uh, services team and our large commodity procurement team. Uh, first off, I'll go over our uh, services. So we'll go over some of our current awarded contracts, some of the opportunities that you'll see coming down the line and uh, the typical team projects that, that we do formulate. Alrighty, so some of the contracts that we currently have, we have a refuse service contract, septic, vehicle lease, sand removal. We have a base laundry BPA, uh, kitchen hoods and ducts cleaning, and integrated services digital network, um, which provides us the capabilities of calling back stateside. Alrighty, some of the upcoming opportunities that you might want to note, uh, our custodial service contract, which is one of our larger contracts, uh, this will be set to expire here in July of this upcoming year, 2022. So the solicitation should be rolling out here around January, February timeframe of 2022. So please do see that on the horizon. Uh, the next one is another one of our large contracts, large services contracts, which is our Wi-Fi service contract. So that is going to expire in December of 22. So in May or June of this upcoming year, you'll see that solicitation. Next is going to be our cell phone service contract that will expire in May of 2022. We'll solicit uh, December of this year, maybe early January of this upcoming year. Um, so please do look for that. And lastly is our generator lease contract. So that one's going to expire here in July of 22 and then soliciting around January, January, February timeframe of 22. Some of our typical projects, um, like the contracts you had just seen, so we have uh, Wi-Fi, we have custodial services, uh, a lot of equipment lease, um, equipment maintenance, laundry, um, the list goes on, basically most any services uh, in order to keep us up and running. All right, I'll now go into some of our large commodities uh, as this is a combined team. So some of the upcoming opportunities and some of the typical things that we see come through. So some of the upcoming opportunities that we have generated right now is our HVAC BPA. So we'll be seeing a BPA. The solicitation will actually be coming out at the end of this month, early next month. Um, we do plan on starting that up uh, shortly after quotations are received in uh, later November of this year. Uh, next will be a lodging furniture BPA. Uh, the solicitation on that one will go out also later this October, early November, and a potential start for also later November of this year, shortly after the quotations are received. Alrighty, some of our typical procurements that we see are, uh, so we have a lot of materials and supplies, uh, and with that, a lot of building materials. Uh, so we'll see concrete, gravel and gatch, uh, pipes, hinges, compressors, AC units. Um, we also see uh, office requirements, so papers, shredders, whiteboards, um, and along with that is furniture. So we see both lodging and office furniture. So everything from bunk beds, tables, desks, chairs, wall lockers, uh, mini refrigerators, uh, full-size refrigerators, um, all the above there. Um, a lot of IT equipment is procured through our flight. So that's anything from uh, software to hardware um, and everything in between. Uh, we also see on an annual basis, uh, gym equipment, uh, as it's used quite frequently, it's, uh, we have to refresh that pretty frequently. We also see washes and dryers, and uh, lastly is mattresses. Alrighty, now I will be passing it on to our uh, government purchase card team. For, or team. Good morning. So my name is Tech Sergeant Willis St. John, and I take care of the government purchase card team. So same thing, here we go. Right now, we don't have any projects identified because our projects come in and we take care of them as soon as we can. Sometimes it's a matter of hours, sometimes it's a matter of days. So those come out pretty frequently. So be sure to send in your capability statements because then it gives us a bigger vendor base to send out those requirements to. 
our, our team usually sends everything out via email. So like it was mentioned before, you're only gonna see emails coming from a .mil or a .gov. So once it comes out, sky's the limit, let's go. So a lot of things we have is printer toners, um, TVs and speakers, furniture um, when they're in smaller quantities. Um, if they're in larger quantities, again, it goes back to Sarn Royball's team. Um, small construction projects, um, very small, <laughs> like less than 2000 US dollars small. Um, building materials, light bulbs, plumbing and HVAC supplies, but all in smaller quantities. So with that, the government purchase card team, our mission is to streamline payment procedures and reduce the administrative burden that is, so, that is associated with purchasing supplies and services. So is, what, what do the vendors need to know? You guys need to know that it's on the spot purchasing and receiving. So we make purchases that are under 35 US, 35,000 US dollars, which roughly is about 9,800 Kuwaiti dinar. Um, and then, like I said, small, very small construction purchases. So. We keep going. The advantages of the GPC team is it's instant payment. If you meet us at the sand pit to deliver something, we pay for it right there. And it's not the process of submitting everything through the wide area workflow system. So shorter lead times, less complex processes, makes for faster payments and fewer competition requirements lead to faster solicitation processes. It also gives us the opportunity for us to go ahead and go downtown or to the local economy and actually purchase things directly from them. So why is it important to do competition with the US government? For us, we need to do the maximum possible opportunity to vendors while ensuring a stable and robust vendor base. We, we love to do these vendor days because it gives us more opportunities to get capability statements and more people that want to do business with us. It also enables us to do the best price to be received for goods and services because we get competition um, as the major mentioned earlier, the best thing is we want to make sure that it is a fair opportunity to all the vendors. And with that, it ensures that we get the best value received for whatever we are soliciting for. So in conclusion, please, please, please send us those capability statements. The email address is at the bottom right here, 386econs.org box all. And again, questions are at the very end. So I'll hand mine over. Well, good day, everyone. I am Yvette Walker, and I am the contracting chief of the Expeditionary District, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, and it is a pleasure to share this event with you today. Today, I basically would like to talk to you a little bit about the Corps, what we do, who we are, what we buy, what contract actions we have forthcoming, and what you say um, currently opportunities we have across the enterprise. So let's start with who are we? So the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers is a federal agency under the Department of Defense. We are a major army command with over 30,000 military and also civilian personnel, making us one of the world's largest public engineering, design, and construction management agencies. We have overall responsibility for the delivery of facilities and infrastructure, supporting the Army, the Air Force, and other defense agencies. Bottom line, the Corps of Engineers is the construction agent for the Defense Department. So where is the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers? We are worldwide and we are also nationwide. The Army Corps of Engineers has a total of eight divisions and under each division, we have several district offices as well as centers of expertise. Today, I am representing the Expeditionary District, and I am currently stationed in Kuwait, and I fall under the Transatlantic Division. I also want to make you aware that there is another district that falls under the Transatlantic Division, and they also do work within Kuwait. They are called the Middle East District. So therefore, when you are looking at the SAM.gov, where you will find many uh, opportunities for the federal government to do contracting with, you will find both the Expeditionary District as well as the Middle East District doing work in this AOR or in this area of responsibility. So let's talk about where does the, what does the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers do? So here is a list of many items of the support and services and construction that we provide worldwide. 
We are, as we stated before, the construction agent for the Department of Defense, but we also support many other efforts. For example, we are a large military construction or we have a large military construction program, but we also support disaster relief efforts by responding to local, national, and global disasters with responsive engineering, contingency planning, as well as construction support capabilities. So what are the what are following examples of what the Corps of Engineers purchases? Well, as we stated before, we are in the construction business. So we do a lot of constructions, for example, barracks, dining facilities, maintenance shops, so hospitals, airfields, and hangars. But we are also in the business of procuring engineering services, such as surveying, mapping, and concept studies. I spoke about what the Corps of Engineers procures across the board, but I really wanna focus on what the Expeditionary District's procurement needs are, only because we are new to Kuwait, not the Corps of Engineers, because as I mentioned before, the Middle East District does work within Kuwait and within this region, but the Expeditionary District has only been in Kuwait for nine months, and we have a lot of work to do to support our customers. So the expeditionary district will be soliciting for various projects. And I want to outline some of those projects that we're gonna need your help with. We currently have a need to solicit for design build construction contracts for the procurement of two dining facilities at the Erbil Air Base in Iraq. It's going to be the Roberts Dining Facility as well as the Strike Dining Facility. These two hardened um, structures will be replacing some tents that serve as dining facilities for our military and our civilian personnel. The Roberts Dining Facility will provide seating for approximately 200 members, and the Strike Dining Facility, which is the largest of the two, will provide seating for approximately 600 personnel. We also may have an anticipated project coming up as well for design build construction, and that will be to construct a new PAX terminal at the Al-Assad Air Base. More to follow on this procurement. As soon as we get the package, you will be seeing information in the SAM.gov that everybody talks about. That is where we will post all of our solicitations and all of our notices of upcoming work that we will need your support with. In addition, the Corps of Engineers will be soliciting for uh, several contract tools that we need your support with. We need tools to be able to rapidly respond to our customers. So we will be putting together some design build, design bid build, and some sustainment restoration and modernization construction contracts. As you heard before from the econ, they called it a MAC. We will probably be soliciting for something similar, but we call it a multiple award task order contract. We will also be soliciting for some single award task order contracts, as well as some job order contracts. And these will be specific for performance in Kuwait, Iraq, and the stands. Talking about the stands, we recently received one of our customers that stated they need assistance with a construction project. So we will be soliciting for a conference center in Kazakhstan. Uh, the project description for this conference center will be a prefabricated metal single story building facility. The construction portion will include the demolition of two existing buildings on the property and some rerouting of some several lines to make room for this prefabricated conference center. The solicitation for that project is anticipated to be released in the SAM.gov website on or about January of 2022. Now for the ones that I previously described, the design build, design bid build, and the sustainment restoration and moder modernization requirements that we're gonna have forthcoming, those you, shall, you, you will see the market research information coming out in the SAM.gov sometime in December. The Regional Contracting Center recently spoke to you about the platforms or the systems that the federal government requires to do business with their contractors. Well, it is no different for the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. We also use the same websites and we also use the same platforms. So therefore, if you would like to have specific information on how to do business with the Corps of Engineers, if you just visit us on that website, it will lead you to a brief video 
and there will be personnel there talking to you on how to do business with us with the core. I would like to encourage each and every one of you to continuously visit that SAM.gov website to find opportunities not only with the Army and the Air Force across the board, but also for the US Army Corps of Engineers across the world, as we cannot accomplish all that we need to do without your support. This brings me to this slide. As I mentioned before, there are two districts under the US Army Corps of Engineers, under the Transatlantic Division that do work in this area of responsibility or in this region. So I wanted to bring to your attention the notice, two, two examples of notices that were posted in SAM.gov. You'll see for the Expeditionary District, if you're looking for work specifically with us, our notice IDs will always start with W5J9JE. If you are looking for work specifically with the Middle East District, you'll notice that their ID always starts with W912ER. If you're looking for any other district within the Army Corps of Engineers, you, they will have also specific notice IDs, but you can always find them just typing in US Army Corps of Engineers and you will most likely receive several notices within the SAM.gov site. At this time, I would just like to thank you for your valuable time. There's also a website there that if you are ever interested in doing business with us, the Expeditionary District, you are more than welcome to send my contracting team your capability statement. That address or that link provided to you is not unique to an individual, but it is for the entire staff. So regardless of whether my personnel change over and return back to the United States, there will be someone to acknowledge and address your concerns if you send any emails or any information into that website. At this point, we will now open up for questions, but I will turn it over to AmCham to moderate the questions session. So thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you so much for those great presentations. So we do have a few questions that came in. Uh, the first one being, can insurance companies provide services to the US military? All right, hey everybody. Uh, can insurance companies provide service to the United States military? Well, the United States military doesn't generally buy insurance. Uh, the federal government self insures, but that said, um, uh, DBA insurance was one of the items that was brought up. Insurance is always a cost of business, whether it's DBA or any other type of insurance. And from an indirect cost uh, uh, perspective, um, absolutely, we would expect that uh, the contractors we enter into business with would, would sell ins insurance. Um, so it, it, yes and no. Uh, it's something that we don't buy outright. Doesn't mean that we never will, um, but we, we generally don't, but we expect it to be a part of the cost of doing business that we would pay for on a regular basis. Thank you so much. Uh, okay, following up on that, could law firms provide services for the U.S. military? Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, see, uh, any type of uh, um, expert advise and, and assist uh, requirements, um, those do come up occasionally. Um, in, a, in, a, in a region that is foreign to the United States, we may require expert services in legal affairs from time to time. Um, I can't think of anything off the top of my head that is currently a requirement, but um, that's that's very possible or improbable in, in, in the future. Thank you. And um, one question came in. If my company has a parent company in the U.S., which is already registered with SAM, me as a local company, do I still have to register in SAM in, in order to be able to do business with you? Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm it, it, it's a it's an if. It's a, it's, a, it's a maybe. I'm getting some some nods and around the table. Uh, I'm going to have someone else address that one, actually. Good morning. So that's actually a great question. So it all depends on your company and how it's structured back home. So if they are in the States and they have different cage codes for different entities. So if you're a, a giant umbrella company and you have smaller companies that do, one does construction, one does services, one does commodities, and each of those three, they want actually separated out for, I don't know, financial reasons, who knows. 
um, or just accounting purposes, they may turn around and create multiple cage codes so that each one of those entities would have their own. Um, but if your company is not set up that way and you are all falling under one umbrella, then you would use the same cage code as your company back. Okay, and how can contractors get invited to, uh, to bid? Huh. Yeah, we can tag team this way. Yeah, please send us your capability statements. We don't know that you're out there if we have no way to contact you. Mm, yes, and uh, it, there's been a couple of websites and, and various uh, other things that have been discussed. We do a lot of email correspondence, but we also and a lot of the other people that are here solicit through SAM.gov. Um, so SAM.gov, anybody can go out there and look at it, look and search through solicitations. Uh, they can narrow it down by uh, geographical areas. Um, but the, the contacts, the information that we have, the email addresses, we rely on some of the databases that we've already talked about, like JCCS, to get that from, and from just lists that have developed over the years and been named by people. So the more uh, information that we have from you, the better those lists will be maintained for us and for those who come on down with us. Definitely, and um, the young lady from the USA kind of spelled it out. Those websites and those org boxes that we're giving you, um, those, it doesn't matter if I rotate out and somebody else comes in my stead, those org boxes are accessible to whoever is currently here. Yes. Thank you very much. Um, and then is there a central number that vendors can contact if they have issues with DUNS or NCAGE? We're playing rock, paper, scissors <laughs> to give you the bad news. Uh, the yeah. bad news is all of those websites have their own, sorry, all those websites have their own, I guess, help desk yes. number. And as much as we would love to say they're super helpful, they take time to sit on hold. So they do. we're sorry. Yeah, when, when I said that there's no cost to entrance, there is no cost in terms of dollars. There's lots of time. There's time. Um, but, and that's, that's what it comes down to. So if, if you're interested and you, you have the commitment to put through the, the time, um, then, then you can get there. And we can help um, on a case-by-case -case basis. But unfortunately, there's no one consolidated. Lots of different entities maintain those databases and those websites. Thank you. And one other question. Um, is there an opportunity for travel and tourism companies to do business with the US military? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. For us, we do them as like, well, tickets and tours and travel and that kind of stuff. So if there is opportunities that you want to present to us, please send those capability statements and don't just send them to one, send them to all of us because <laughs> we all have different personnel that work on the different installations. So please send that stuff forward and we will work through our different channels, whether it's NAF or things like that to get them done and get them where they need to go. Couldn't agree more. Thank you. And uh, what should the capability statement include? Is there a format or is there something in particular that you're looking for? Uh, my biggest thing is how do I contact you and what do you provide? So if you're a construction company, tell me whether you do design build, design bid build, or if you prefer to do things in prefabricated buildings, just give us some specifics. If it's something we can't figure out, we're gonna send you a message back going, that was wonderful. Can you expound on whatever we can't figure out? Yeah. So just information and how to contact. Yeah, and if you're already registered in systems, that's a big uh, plus. And let us know, what is your DUNS number? What is your CAGE number? What is your JCCS registration number? Because that'll go a long way. Otherwise, it's, it's a little bit uh, like a treasure hunt where we have to figure out uh, who you are to make sure that you're the company that we think you are. So if you provide us those unique identifiers, it will definitely help. Thank you. And uh, last question. If we have a solution or a product that we wish for the US military to be aware of, how can we present this solution to the military? Send it, send it in the brochure. Send us the pictures, the documentations, of just maybe a brief synopsis of what it is and how it, how you feel it would be helpful to us. Anything else from around the room? 
I'm getting nods up and down. So yes, give us enough specifics to figure it out and kind of see where you're going with it. And then we can respond back to you and ask for more information if we need it. Yeah, it's like anything else. Sometimes we don't know our own problems till someone points them out. Uh, and, and there's a lot of times where innovation could solve a problem that we've had for years. We just never thought about asking the right questions. There's nothing wrong with providing an unsolicited proposal. Um, there's just no guarantees that it'll ever materialize. But it's if you think it's a good idea, let us know about it. Thank you. And uh, does the FTA make any impact? Uh, this person said our country is already on FTA with USA. Do we get extra points? Can you tell us what that acronym means, please? Yeah, was that FTA? Free trade, free trade agreement. Free trade agreement? Yeah, free trade agreement. Yeah, so that, that's that. Um, it depends on what we're buying, I would have to say. So the free trade agreement has, uh, you know, it, it applies some certain US uh, requirements, laws to the contract, uh, depending upon the dollar amount and how much uh, of something or what type of something we're buying. So it is a 100% of depends question. Some things we can only buy if it is compliant with the free trade agreement. Um, but that, again, that comes back to how much, uh, what we are buying and how much it's going to cost. Thank you. And just to be clear, because a lot of people are asking the same question, basically, how do they send their capabilities to you? This would be done via email that you've already provided in the presentation, correct? That is correct. Yes. Wonderful. Um, and we have another question. Someone wants a point of contact in Bahrain, and I think this would be taken offline. Uh, in order to assist them with the registrations, which they've tried in the past, yet they still face a lot of issues with it. And I think this is the same for many companies who are yet to register in the SAM system. Yeah, yeah. That, 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 on a case by case basis, like I said, we can't assist. We're definitely not experts. The help desks can provide a lot more information that we can, um, but we'll give it our, our best shot on a case by case basis. I don't think we'll be able to solve any any problems today though. Uh, and can hospitals be part of the bidding process and are these requests common? Common, probably not, but uh, yes, definitely. Um, they are a requirement from time to time. Right now, my office has a blanket purchase agreement for uh, healthcare services. Uh, and there is a process uh, to to enter into uh, the, the blanket ordering agreement with the United States government, um, it's done periodically. Uh, and when that comes about, we'll, we'll, we'll go out and do the market research and put out the solicitation. Um, the same requirements for registration would apply uh, and the solicitation evaluation procedures would also be uh, in, you know, applicable. But yeah, on occasion we do require medical and dental services, things of that nature, in addition to what we provide our own uh, forces on our installations here. Thank you. I haven't seen it personally here, but there's always a possibility. Yeah. Um, if I wish to open a supermarket or any store of, you know, of any type in one of the bases, um, how can I do that? So that's actually done through our NAF or non-appropriated funds concessionaire contracts. So again, please send your capability statements to us and we can actually route them to the offices that take care of that. Just note that there are some limitations. Um, if there's already, if there's already a, like a business on the base that is doing that, um, they do not allow competing businesses. So like if you are a burger company and you wanna make burgers, but there's already a burger company on the base, they may just turn around and say, thank you for your interest, but right now that would be a competing requirement. So there's lots of different possibilities to it, but please send us your information. And the worst we can do is tell you, I'm sorry, there's already one on base doing it. So please let us know. Thank you so much. And uh, will when, when companies are bidding and then there's the results already, do you usually share this with all the participants who bid it on this tender or whether they were awarded or not? 
So we are supposed to, I can't guarantee it always happens, um, but we do strive to do it all the time to let you know via award notices. Um, if it comes out on, um, well, it's not FBO anymore, Sam. uh, sam.gov, yeah. the award notice goes out to let you know that it was awarded to company A at so much money. Um, but when they're smaller things, we try and reach back out to everybody who submitted, I guess, submitted a, a quote to us to send it back and say, hey, this has been awarded or this is this requirement has been canceled. So I, I do get a lot of those, like, do you still need this? So we try and let you guys know that, nope, it was either canceled or it was awarded to whomever. Yeah. Email correspondence is generally the way that works for the smaller requirements. Uh, anything that's automated through the system, the a system SAM.gov will generate uh, upon award. Um, well, some of the systems will at least, but the uh, the email uh, uh, will, will be very uh, brief. It won't provide a ton of information and it's basically just going to let folks know, let the offers know that the solicitation is no longer a solicitation either because it was awarded or canceled. There's not gonna be a lot of detail in there um, if, if contractors, if, if offers wanted to get more, uh, they are entitled to ask and those requirements or those, those elements will be spelled out in the solicitation. Uh, and we can provide certain information in order to encourage uh, you to grow as a company and to sharpen your skills for the, for the next solicitation. And last question, is it possible for hotels to participate in any of the bids? Like, let's say if you have people coming in from the U.S., uh, do you commonly, you know, do business with hotels in order to lodge them? Or do you have uh, any type of services which hotels could offer to you? Yes, just like we are being afforded the opportunity today, especially for conference centers or, or spaces in order to hold things like that. Um, we definitely utilize that probably more than anything. I don't know about day to day, like you know, people like staying in rooms, we don't commonly use that one too much out here, but especially for conference spaces and things like that, we definitely use them. Yeah, I can, I can, I can say that the Army has had requirements several over the past um, six months uh, within the region more broadly for um, short-term lodging, which we have used hotels for. Uh, that comes up on an as-needed basis, on a case-by-case -case basis. It's not a standing requirement or a reoccurring need, but uh, should it occur, absolutely, we do have requirements for that from time to time. It mostly comes back, like everything else, to your ability to compete, to be registered in the systems, which allows you to enter into to contracts with us. Well, thank you. Uh, I'd like to thank all the presenters for the wonderful presentations this morning. It's a great deal of uh, amazing information. We're excited about uh, the way forward. Uh, we're going to take a 15 minute break and then we'll have the presentation from the Bahrain Amsham. Again, thank you all and uh, we'll see you back shortly. Good afternoon. I'd like to welcome everyone back for this final session. I am Mary McGinnis, the Executive Director of the AmCham Bahrain. On behalf of the other AmChams and members participating in this event, we thank Paula and her team at AmCham Kuwait for their excellent work in organizing this important and useful event. And we thank our military partners for their time and expertise. For the non-American members on this call, non-AmCham <laughs> has nothing to do with your nationality, but for the non-AmCham members on the call, I want to say that this event is a good example of the type of service and value AmCham brings to its members. How to do business with is part of an ongoing series that has included how to do business with the US government, US Navy, as well as how to do business with the local governments in the GCC. If you are interested to know more about the benefits of membership, please contact your local AmCham. Following the excellent presentations of our military partners, we are pleased to offer the next presentation from a layman's and contractor's perspective, using less technical terms on how to do the necessary steps to qualify for US government contracts and to find the opportunities. I am pleased to introduce our speaker, Michael Sedge. He's president of Michael Bruno, LLC, 
with companies in the USA, Bahrain, Italy, and Djibouti. He has 48 years of experience working with and for the United States government overseas. He has also authorized, authored 14 books, two of which deal with the US government, published more than 4,000 articles and has produced four films and two television series. So um, Michael's a very busy, busy man um, and included in his bio is he, he's a former president of AmCham Italy and an active member of AmCham Bahrain. He's a successful businessman who uses the advice he will share with us today. And we will have a Q&A session after Michael's presentation. So please submit your questions in the chat box throughout his session. Michael, I hand the stage to you. Thank you, Mary. Uh, I wanna welcome everyone back. Uh, I have actually been listening to all the presentations so far today. And as a contractor, I can say that you're probably a bit confused with all the military terminology and the bar clauses and everything else. So my role today is to bring it all down to earth so that everyone listening can understand. And if you have any questions, my email is right there. Feel free to contact me. I will say that uh, I'm the president of Michael Bruno, as Mary pointed out. Our main role is we do architectural design, engineering, construction management, and a few services exclusively for the US government. So if you are a construction company or you are a design company, please send me an email because we are owned by Reliant Global, which is a US company that does global construction for the US military. And we are always looking for good partners. Uh, you know, prior to, you'll see that my discussion is doing business with the United States government. Prior to this, it was with the US military. There's a reason for that. 57% on average of the American annual budget is spent on military. So it's a very big market. Uh, I, I reach out to my Army Air Force colleagues for their presentation this morning. And I also want to point out, I saw one of my longtime friends, Tom Dollard, on the, on the uh, presentations here. So Tom, if you have time, reach out to me and we'll chat a bit. So next slide, please. So on average over the past three years, this is the annual budget of the United States government. And as I said, you'll see there 57% is basically defense. Uh, all the other areas are basically what fills up international and domestic spending. Next slide, please. Just to give you an example of who buys services and products in your region. These are just some of the military commands. And let me just quickly run through a couple of these. Uh, someone in the last session asked about uh, opening up a grocery store or something like that in the, in the local military base. Uh, the Navy exchange on the US Navy bases is responsible for all retail sales. On the Army Air Force bases, they have what they call the AFIs, the Army Air Force Exchange Service. They handle all the retail sales. If you are selling food, it would be DECA. That's the Defense Commissary Agency. They're the ones who have the grocery stores on the bases. But as I'm listening to the prior presentations, I just made a quick list of some of the products and services that the United States government in your region will purchase. And that includes oil and gas, aviation support. They have airports. They do contracts for airports maintenance, airports, airport facilities. Uh, you know, the people that come up to the airplanes with the, with the um, elevators and baggage, that's all contracted out by the government. Educators. Uh, we have a contract in Africa right now with the U.S. government that we have two educators on the base. Uh, food services, dental services, public relations services, vehicles, uh, power, electricity, and phone services, including internet technology, disaster relief. Uh, I've received 
a month ago when Afghanistan was going on, I received at least 20 requests for services, including tents, beds, food services, laundry services, uh, shower facilities, toilet facilities, all of that came flooding in as a result of Afghanistan relief. Uh, some of the other ones, custodial services, you know, your genital service, your cleaning services, legal services. They, the U.S. government contracts out legal services for local uh, national. For example, we're in Bahrain, we're in Kuwait. The U.S. government needs an expert in legal services. They contract that out. Real estate services, uh, restaurant services, retail services. Someone mentioned hotel. We had two contracts for hotel services, primarily to host a one-week conference. They needed 21 rooms. They needed a conference center. That's the type of hotel services that you would be looking at. Also, logistical and transportation. So almost anything that you do, the United States government, in one way or the other, needs those type of services. Next slide, please. So how do you begin? In the last presentation, you know, they did a run through of register with guns, do this, do this, do this. It is not easy. Uh, you know, the, the system is complicated. The first thing that you need to do is you need to register for a data universal numbering system or a DUNS code. And down at the bottom of the page is the link where you can go do that. They'll basically ask information on number one, are you a US based company or a foreign company? That will make a difference. Once you go through the list, it's just, it's easy, it's free. Uh, once you complete that, then you move on to the next step, but you'll need information, specific information on your company, on your owners, on your uh, bank accounts. All of this information goes into the DUN system. That is the system that the United States government, when you register with them, they refer to all that information for payments, for, com you know, for compliance of regulations to make sure you're a valid company. All of this goes through DUNS. Next page. As you're going through DUNS, this used to be a separate registration, but they've combined them. You'll have to come up with a commercial and government entity registration number. Uh, that's a unique number that is assigned to your company. And fortunately, the DUNS and CAGE registration have now been combined. So you fill out the DUNS registration, you'll automatically be assigned a CAGE code. If you are not a U.S. company, you will get an NCAGE, uh, which officially started out as a NATO CAGE number for non-U.S. companies, but now all international companies are assigned the free NCAGE code. So like I said, as you are registering for DUNS, you will automatically receive the CAGE code. Next slide, please. Once you have the DUNS and the CAGE, then it's time to go into the government system and register with what's traditionally called SAM, which is a system of award management. And you go to the website. It's a bit complicated. Uh, because that's also where you go for government opportunities. But what you need to do for the initial step is you want to register as a company. So you click on the Get Started link, and it will ask you for your registration numbers, your management, your financial information. And it's a complicated long-term process. Don't think you're going to do it in a couple of hours. It's something that's gonna require your finance people, your management people, your legal people. But once you get that done, and there's the registration down below where you click to get that, it's all free. Once you get that completed, then you are ready for business. Next stage, please, or next slide. 
And that is, for example, this is the Michael Bruno registration in the SAM, in the uh, government registration system. You can print this out. And we've had times in the past where the contracting office will say, can you send us a copy of that? But the government does have access to this. And what they will do is when they are evaluating a contract award, they will go in to make sure that you are registered and all your information is in here. What I might also say is embassies, US embassies and consulates also issue grants uh, periodically for projects and for different opportunities. If you are registered in SAM, it automatically assists them in verifying your information for any grant requests or any type of support of this kind. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, one other thing that will be requested when you register with SAM is the North America Industry Classification System Code. Um, what does that mean? If you are in the hotel business, there's a code for the hotel business. If you are in the construction business, there is a code. In other words, for construction in particular, they'll say, what type of construction? Do you do horizontal? Do you do um, mechanical? Do you do electrical? There's a code for every one of those. And sometimes if your code is not specified in the same registration, the contracting officer will come back and say, well, you're not registered to do this type of work. So be sure that you look at these uh, North American industry classification codes and make sure you have a list of everything that you do as a company so that when you go in and register in SAM, you put the right codes in there. Next slide. So primarily, and there are five different types of contracts that the US government put out. And in one of the previous presentations, they kind of rushed through these and they mentioned a lot of what they call the FAR clauses. Uh, the federal acquisition reg regulations are basically the laws that dictate uh, buying for the US government. So rather than go through all of those, because those are the type of thing that when you go after a contract, they will list all of those. And at that point, you can uh, research them and find out what they're all about. But the important thing is to know the five types of contracts that the US government put out. Uh, these are the five firm fixed contracts, cost reimbursement contracts, indefinite delivery contact contracts, and in a previous uh, presentation, you heard the lady say, well, we put out IDIQ contracts. Well, if you're familiar with that term, fine. But if you're not, what she meant was indefinite delivery contracts in which you could get a contract of this type. And as the government has a requirement, they send it to you and you bid on that requirement. Uh, this is very frequent, these type of contracts in construction business where they will say, okay, for the next five years, we're going to put out an indefinite delivery contract. And any of the contractors that have this award are able to bid on work for the next five years. And only those people with that contract can bid on this work. Uh, another type of contract is the time and materials and labor hour contracts. Next slide, please. So let's start with firm fixed price contracts. Uh, these are very common. Uh, right now, I think we have seven of these type of contracts where the government will need something. They will put out a solicitation for the contract and they will basically say, we need 100 containers of fruit. And so everyone that can provide that, that's registered with the US government, will go through the contract, put together their pricing and send it to the government. They will select a winner based on the price. So they will say, okay, this contract is worth $1 million. That's a firm fixed price contract. They do not expect to increase that price. They don't expect to decrease that price. 
that is exactly what they will give to you. Next slide. Cost reimbursement contract. This is very common when government has doubts about exactly what the cost will be. For example, uh, they may say, we want to give you a contract for hotel services for one year, but we know that every month the pricing may change. So what we're going to do is we're going to give you a contract that says, for administration, we're going to pay you 100. And then as we have a requirement, we're going to come to you. You're going to give us the price for that requirement in addition to your overhead and your profit. And so basically it is a base price plus whatever services they need, you will provide the pricing for that and then add your pricing on top of that. We have a contract like this right now in Africa and they pay us a fixed fee every month just for the administrative aspects of the contract. And then as they come in, we do direct cost plus 8% uh, markup on that. So next slide. Indefinite delivery contracts, uh, very similar to number two. The difference is they do not pay you a guarantee. They basically say, we need telecommunication services, which may include satellite, IT services, telephone services, but they don't know exactly what they need at that moment. So they might issue a five-year contract for indefinite delivery services. As they have a requirement, they will come to you and say, we need IT services for this military installation. Give you all the specifications, you price that out. And if you, based on your contract, they will issue you a task order under this indefinite delivery contract. Next slide. Uh, time in materials. This is a contract that is very frequently used for operations and maintenance. For example, uh, there, the US Navy has a contract for satellite telecommunications services. And basically what that means is they give a contract to a company for five years and say, we need you to operate and maintain our telecommunications services via satellite and you figure out what you need. A company may come back and say, we're gonna need 10 technicians and we're gonna need two outside plant engineers. So those are the fixed hour time individuals. Then if they have to build anything, if they have to buy materials, that is an addition to that fixed price for the time. Next, uh, next slide. And the final uh, very common contract type is labor hours. We currently have four contracts of this type where they basically tell us we need a construction engineer for three years. We look at the requirements, we come up with the labor hours and we submit a uh, contract to the government saying, this individual for one year will cost us this in labor, which does not include overtime, does not include benefits. We give them that. And basically they pay. Okay. Next slide. Okay. Um, the United States government almost exclusively go, you know, has open competitions. Uh, there are a few exceptions. There are some, some U.S. laws that require for small business, that require for native Alaska companies, but those are traditionally domestic, used only in the United States. So almost exclusively, you are going to see open competitions uh, in your region for everything that the United States government needs. Uh, when they put out a solicitation or, uh, uh, you know, a request for proposal, they are going to provide the instructions of how to submit your proposal. 
They're going to tell you what type of services or products they need with specifications. Uh, they're going to give you an opportunity to ask questions. So let's say, for example, they put out a solicitation today. They may say, we'll take questions up to 5 November. So you know that if you have questions and they'll give you an email to submit your questions to the contracting office up to that date. They will also provide the deadline and the procedures to present your proposal, whether it's going to be uh, you know, printed and delivered by a courier, if it's going to be sent by uh, email, or if it's going to be sent by some other method. Sometimes the United States government will set up a, uh, a Dropbox type service where they say, okay, submit all your proposals this way. But they will give you all that information in the original solicitation. Next slide. So the next question is great. You know, I'm registered, I'm ready to go. I don't see any opportunities. Where do I find them? Uh, they used to have what they called federal business opportunities. Now that has merged with the SAME Gov. So the same place that you go to register SAME Gov is the same place you will go to find 90% of all opportunities uh, because federal mandates dictate that you know US government entities should, unless it's a, a very local solicitation, uh, should advertise everything on the SAMGov website. So you'll go in there, uh, once you're registered with SAM, once you go into the website, there's a link that says opportunities, you click on that, and then you can basically go in and say, for example, Kuwait, and it will give you all the opportunities coming out of Kuwait or Bahrain or wherever, or you could actually say the region and it will give you all the region. So you can search that way. Um, however, there are some local opportunities. United States Embassy. Uh, my company saw an opportunity two years ago for renovation design of the US Embassy in Bahrain. Uh, we applied for that, we, we prepared our proposal, so we submitted it, we won the contract. And so there are ways to find additional opportunities. Down below is a website that the Navy uses for most of their opportunities regionally for the Middle East, for Africa, and from Europe. So what I'm basically saying is 90% of what you're gonna look for is gonna come under SAMGov. The other 10, 15% is gonna come through these local advertising and also local websites. Next slide. So, you know, I'm, I'm a big marketing person. I'm the kind of person that says, well, I don't want to wait for an opportunity to come out. I want to know in advance what's coming out. Uh, so how do you do that? Uh, you know, what opportunities are coming? What if we do not have the qualifications to participate and get that contract? Or what happens after I win? And is there a guide to government contracts? So next slide, we'll, we're going to talk about each of these. So positioning, and I'll, let me just give you some examples. If you come up, let's just say you're in the construction business, but you've never worked with the US government. If you can team up with companies that have worked with the US government, then you are one step ahead of everyone else. And what, get one example, I found out through a government source that there was a contract coming up in the Joint, Joint Task Force Horn of Africa, Engineering Division J44. And I found out that they were gonna use a contract that has already been awarded, a, a worldwide contract, that I was not part of that contract. So I called the contracting office at the Navy base and said, who do you suggest I contact, I need to find a partner. They gave me a name. I reached out to two or three of these partners. One of the partners reached out and said, well, if you're in Africa, 
we're not there. We could use you as our partner. So we put together a, what's a teaming agreement that they would have the contract, they would be the prime contractor, but I would do the work for them. We won the contract, it lasted five years. Uh, another one is the Bahrain multi-award construction contract. You know, we're a design firm. We do not do construction as a core business. So we found out what companies there are that do that. We reached out to them. When they bid the contract, we became the design partner. At the end, the government selected five companies to do the construction in Bahrain for the next five years. We were the design partner for all five companies. You know, we had an, we, we made an agreement with everyone that said, we'll give you the same price. Everyone, they'll, they'll be even competition as far as design. So those are two examples of trying to position yourself before a competition comes out. Another example, try to meet the clients. If you're in Kuwait, find out who the contracting officers are. Uh, earlier on, you know, one of the gentlemen said, we, we try to get, we want to give equal competition to everyone. Well, he also added, during the, during the solicitation phase, well, that doesn't mean that you cannot reach out to a contracting officer prior to the solicitation phase and say, what are you looking for? And they can easily say, well, we have three opportunities coming up. Here's what they are. You can look at those opportunities and you can say, I'm not qualified for this, so I need to find a partner. I'm qualified for this, I can bid it myself. That's the advantage that I see as far as advanced positioning. Another example, if you're selling uh, products, someone mentioned earlier, well, you know, we want to try and set up a grocery store. You won't be able to do that because of an exclusive global contract with the defense commissary agency. But what you can do is you could contact the local Navy or Army Air Force Exchange and you could say, I want to set up, I want to become a vendor. I want to set up a concession for the Navy Exchange or Army Air Force Exchange and get in there and sell your products. Normally, they have a system where concessionaires can come in for 90 days and then you rotate. But if you do good sales, they'll find a way to get you in there for more time. So, you know, reach out to the Navy Army Air Force Exchange if you're doing that. Someone mentioned hotels. Reach out to the Morale, Welfare, and Recreation Services. They're the ones who coordinate uh, rest and relaxation, vacations, holidays. They're also uh, the Fleet and Family Service Center. That is an organization that has off-base or, uh, conferences and organizations. They're the ones who say, we need a hotel for one week, and we need 35 rooms, and we need a conference center, and we want food, and here's what we want. Those are where you're going to go, and those do not require uh, SAM registration. Navy Exchange does not require SAM registration. Army Air Force exchanges. The Morale, Welfare, and Recreation Office of the Base, they do not require SAM. Uh, Fleet and Family Services Center do not require SAM. So if you're lo offering local services and support, those are some very quick contacts that you can reach into and get some additional business. Next slide. Okay, you, let's just say you see an opportunity, but you don't have the qualifications. Government allows for partnering. They allow for teaming, which means I have a company, uh, good example, uh, there's a contract by the government called Seaport. My company is a prime contractor. We have the Seaport contract, but we do not provide telecommunication services. So we saw an opportunity. We reached out to a company called Rome Research Corporation or RRC. We made a teaming agreement with them. They put together the proposal. They put together the pricing. We took it. We put our markup on top of it and submitted it and we won the contract. So what I'm basically saying here is you may have a service or a product 
that a prime contractor for the U.S. government requires. If they do not know you exist, they cannot call you. Another example, uh, a Motorola antenna installation, a company out of the United Kingdom with a contract with Motorola. Motorola had a contract with the United States government. They needed to put in antennas. But one of the antennas was in Africa, another one was in Europe. They had, uh, the, the contractor had no offices in these locations. They contacted us. They gave us a contract. So by default, we got US government work putting in antennas through the second party. So don't overlook those. Partners can, can offer opportunities uh, and also they can give you some information and help you grow as a company. So that if you work with partners for three or four years, you become very familiar with what the government system is all about. So look for teaming agreements, look for those type of opportunities. Um, let's see what I have here. U.S. Army Corps of Engineers Middle East Region Construction Contract. That is one of those five-year indefinite quantity contracts. My mother company, Reliant, they're going after those kind of contracts as a prime contractor, but they are looking for partners. And most of the major companies do look for partners in your region. Next slide. Uh, so what happens after you win a contract? I've seen a lot of companies that have won contracts and then they say, okay, now we'll get together with the government and negotiate. The government does not negotiate after they've done a solicitation and you have given them a proposal and have won the contract. Once you've done that, there are no negotiations. Uh, they will, for every contract, the contracting officer, who is basically a lawyer for the government, the contracting officer will assign a, a core or a contracting officer's representative for your contract. That's your point of contact. So anything that happens, any issues, you will go through what they call the core. And then if there are issues that can't be resolved between the contracting officer representative and yourself, then it will go to the contracting office. Um, a lot of people like to work with the United States government because they say they pay well. Uh, in one of the previous discussions, I, I saw that they said, okay, we pay in 30 days. The truth is, if you follow the system. And right now they have what's called the Wide Area Workforce System or WAWF. Basically, it's an online payment system where all of your invoices are uploaded to that website. If everything goes well, you're paid in 14 to 21 days. That's at this very moment, that's the average pay time. The problem with the WAWF system is, depending on what type of contract you have, it requires you to have a bank account in the United States. Now, for some companies, that's not a problem because they say, okay, I have my local bank here. They have an affiliate in New York, so we'll open up the bank there. But it is something to keep in mind. The exception to the Wawa payment system is when they issue a local contract in local currency. That means you'll be submitting your invoice to the local contract office and they will pay locally. Uh, but I would say 90%, 95% of all payments go through the WOWF system. Next slide. Um, you know, I've been doing this for many, many years and I've seen a lot of books and I've written my own books and everything else. Uh, but one of the best basic guidelines for working with the United States government uh, is this book here by Mark Lamar. Mark is a lawyer in Washington who works only with U.S. government contracts. Uh, I know him well. In fact, at the beginning, we were going to write this book together. Uh, I didn't have time, so Mark wrote it himself. But if you're looking for a basic guideline on how to register, how to get things done in the U.S. government, a step-by-step -step guideline, I would recommend this. Uh, it's available on Amazon and a couple of other locations, so you can buy it online. Uh, next slide, please. 
And there we are. Let's see. That was pretty good timing. I think we're at, what, 38 minutes or so. So if you have questions, I'd be happy to answer them. And we'll open it up and Mary can kind of look through the questions. Yes, thank you so much, Michael. Um, very helpful. So um, some of the questions that have come through in the chat box, so we'll start with those. Uh, how, um, so does the US Embassy also put out their opportunities through SAM? And is there a specific system where companies can see what the US embassies in their countries have available? Uh, some embassies do primarily for the larger projects. They will go to SAM and put those out. Uh, the smaller projects, most of the embassies will put out local advertising. Some of the embassies, if you go to the embassy website, some of them actually have a link to opportunities. Uh, for example, I can give an example from Europe. The European embassies got together and assigned uh, the U.S. Embassy in Frankfurt as the headquarters for all requirements. So the U.S. Embassy in Frankfurt puts out all the requirements for Europe. Uh, as I explained earlier, in Bahrain, the embassy put out a local advertisement in the papers, uh, the local newspapers for a design company. For the construction, their intention was to put that onto SAM because the value is, is much more than the design. So it's a combination and each embassy does their own little thing. I know that the US embassy in Rome, for example, they have a link where you can click on their website it says opportunities, you click on that and it will say, you know, we need uh, floral services for an, an event coming up next week. Uh, so those type of things. So a lot of this has to do with research. Uh, there is no one site catches all, uh, because like I said, if it's under 250,000, they're not required to go to the SAM website. So some of them say, well, let's not do this because we want a local provider and they will do that themselves. Well, I know 250,000 US dollars is uh, significant for many SMEs. So uh, it does take a lot of just kind of daily homework, uh, networking and reading the local paper, going to websites uh, to stay informed, it sounds like, for those types of opportunities. When I, first started our, when I first started our company, I made a list of 10 things that our secretary in the office would come in and do every day. <laughs> check this website, check this website, check the local newspaper. And so at the end of the day, she say nothing, nothing, nothing. And it may, you know, six months, months might go by with nothing, but then she'll say, oh, wait, there's an opportunity. That one opportunity is worth those six months. Good advice. Um, so with the SAM.gov, is there a way to, um, a, a question that was submitted uh, in advance was for a uh, company that actually makes uh, tensile fabric structures. So a pretty specific uh service. Um, so how can they uh, use these resources, these websites, SAM.gov, to know what specific tenders and opportunities are out there? And, you know, and to generalize this for other uh, companies as well. My suggestion for uh, producers of this type of product or any type of, let's say, construction type project, U.S. government does not traditionally go out and buy material. What they will do is they will have a solicitation for a design build project of that type of material. So my suggestion to those companies, do some research, find out what are the construction companies working for the United States government in your region or the major companies. And I'll give you a good example because my mother company, Reliant, we just bid a, bid a contract like that. It was like prefabricated structures of this type and we want to put in 20. And so if Reliant had a relationship or knew of this company that produced these, then they could easily reach out and say, give me a price for 20 of these. They have to be delivered to this location. So my suggestion for manufacturers of this type of material, reach out to the government contractors, the prime contractors that have the construction contracts, offer your services to them. 
Uh, we have an office in Bahrain. We're engineers, designers. So a lot of companies come to us and say, here's our brochure. Here's our products. Here's what we do. Why do they come to us? Because we're the first step in a design build project. We're the people that gets the project, pulls the materials together, design it, engineer it, and then the construction people take it over. So reach out to those local resources, become their partners, let them know that you're available. If they do not know you exist, they can never use your products. Um, well, just to clarify, this company actually does uh, produce uh, structures that are just happen to be made out of tensile fabric, uh, sprung um, instant structures is their name. But to, uh, to that point, how do you do that networking? Where do you find the local? And we have uh, five different GCC countries online today. So where do you find those local um, government contractors to either be a prime and you would be the subcontractor for them or you're the prime and you're looking for subcontractors? If you're talking design construction industry, there's an organization, worldwide organization, uh, primarily made up of former military officers uh, called the Society of Military Engineers, SAME. Uh, that is your first location. Become a member of SAME, you'll get a directory of about 5,000 companies to reach out to. Uh, they have annual conferences. Uh, they have chapters. Uh, I'm the president of the regional chapter uh, for Europe, Middle East, Africa. And so we have periodical meetings and bring people together. Uh, but that would be the, the one organization that covers it all for construction, engineering, that type of work. Uh, there are other organizations, depending on what your product is, whatever your service is. Telecommunications, you offer IT services, you offer tele uh, you know, telephone services, whatever. The mili uh, military communications, MILCOM, that is a global organization. They have conferences two or three times a year in the United States. They have regional conferences. Those are the places to go meet with the telecommunications people and say, well, here's what we do. Uh, I met up, we're a member of that. I met with a couple of uh, members there two years ago. And three weeks ago, I got a call from one of the companies and said, we're doing a project in Northern Africa and we need your support for this. So those are the type of things, do a little research as far as what you produce, what you provide, because there are hundreds of military organizations, let's say military of affiliated or U.S. government affiliated organizations that work for the U.S. government that you could contact and reach out to and say, here's what I'm offering you. Um, that's excellent. And I also want to give a plug for AmCham's as an excellent platform for networking and finding uh, future partners. So I want to invite all of the AmCham representatives who are online to put in the chat box your contact information so people can reach out to you and find ways to connect to others. And I'll do the same. Um, so we... Uh, Somebody wanted you to repeat the name of the departments in charge of business to hotels. I believe that was MWR. Um, it's, it's morale, welfare, and recreation. Every base has a morale, welfare, and recreation office. Their job is specifically to come up with tours for the military on that base, to come up with sports activities, to come up with anything that has to do with off-duty activities for individuals, for families in the military. So that's one organization. The other one is the Fleet Family Services Center. Primarily that is a U.S. Navy operation. So if you're near a U.S. Navy base, they probably have a Fleet Family Services Center. They are the ones that, uh, that we've worked with in the past and gone out and gotten hotels for conventions, uh, this type of thing. But most bases, if, well, I won't say most, depending on where you're at, but many bases, if you go in and you say, let's take Bahrain, for example, Naval Support Activity Bahrain, a website will come up and it will give you contacts for 
morale, welfare, and recreation office, fleet family services office, those type of things, and send a message, reach out to the people, and let them know what you have to offer because timing is everything. You know, you might reach out to them today and they say, okay, thank you for your message. And you may not hear something for three months. And then you might send a follow up message and say, we're glad you reached out to us because next month we need this. And so timing is everything. Make sure you continue to work with them, continue to follow up with them. May not happen to me today, may not happen tomorrow. Eventually, they will need your services. So um, use Google, uh, look those uh, organizations up at local or your nearby uh, military base and their contact information will be there. And your AmCHAMs can assist with that as well. Um, Correct. And those are some of the organizations that do not require you to be registered with, with uh, SAMGOV. Right. Um, so with um, some people earlier had, you know, spoken about the, and as we all know, and you stated very clearly in the beginning, um, it seems easy enough to uh, go through all the registration steps to be eligible to apply for these uh, contracts, uh, you know, Sam, Doug, of just being one of them. But, you know, in reality, there's, you know, a simple little box that, you know, wasn't checked right, and it becomes a, a mystery <laughs> of how to move forward. So, um, uh, is there is there help out there for people who, you know, just want to do it? Uh, and and to be very clear, it's a totally free process. Nobody has to pay for um, access to do business with the U.S. government. But there are services that can help people can do it for them. So how do you find someone who is legit uh, and you know that um, it's going to be a fair and what's an average price to pay if you are going to um, ask someone to help you with this service? Sure. I mean, there are many, many services out there and I, and we have used some, you know, despite my years of experience, uh, there have been uh, situations where I said, you know, I just can't do this. It's easier to pay someone. Uh, I will give an example. Uh, we had some issues with SAM registration three years ago, and it's an annual process, so you have to re-register. And I was trying to change our address. That process became so complicated that I finally reached out to an agency in Washington, and I think we paid $120, and they took care of it. For one of the challenges we have is, which, which I assume most of your uh, participants have, we're not in the United States. So they say, call this toll-free number. Well, it's not a toll-free number for us. We're international. And sometimes those toll-free numbers you can't even dial into from outside the United States. So we got to a point where we said, how do we do this? We did a search on uh, SAME registration support, and we came up with about 25 companies. What I did was most of these will have references and they'll say, okay, you know, this person said this. And so I, I called a couple later, sent emails to some of these references and they said, a perfect company, excellent. And so we selected one of those. We said, here's what we need. They came back and said, it will cost $125 fixed fee. We'll follow it through from the beginning to the end. One of their representatives, once we said yes, called me on the phone, international phone call. They called us. They walked us through the steps. They asked us a few questions and said, okay, give us uh, you know, 48 hours. And it took them a little bit longer, but we got the issue resolved. And it was just one headache that I was pleased to pay the money to get it over with. So you know, there are reputable companies. Do some research. If you have issues, feel free to send me an email and I can send you a couple of uh, contacts that we've used in the past. Great, thanks. Um, here's a specific question. Can a single company involve two different contracts like indefinite delivery and time materials? Yes, definitely. An example, my company that does engineering architectural design, we probably have 12 co contracts right now. My mother company, Reliant, 
uh, in the United States, they have about 37 contracts right now around the world. Um, great. So one question is, are these resources that were, you know, in all the processes that we're talking about today for commercial uh, opportunities only, or are they also for military sales and opportunities? It'd be interesting to know what you mean by military sales. Well, I'll tell you, in, in Bahrain, my understanding, and I think this is different for every country, but to sell military equipment or services, it's a government to government um, relationship. And you have to go through the Office of Military Cooperation at the US Embassy to do that. And the US Embassy Office of Military Cooperation, OMC, is always looking for private industry uh, to be a part of this. But um, at least in Bahrain, you don't have direct contact with the um, the foreign government yes, military. Right. Exactly. exactly. And that's, that's for military equipment as well as construction and this type of thing. Uh, it's the U.S. government that manages all of that. So they're the contracting office. They're the ones who will put out everything. They'll give you the specification. And then they will coordinate with the local, national, whatever the foreign military sale company or country is. So where are those opportunities? Is that at the local embassy OMC website or is that, you know, where do you, you know, that somebody. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Normally, if you're talking military sales, mm -hmm. as far as equipment and that type of thing, it will go through the embassy. Okay. Uh, if you're talking, for example, uh, we're working on one right now in Israel. Uh, they want to build a military installation for the Israeli military but it is funded by the US government. And so that comes out under Fed, uh, under um, SAM.gov. Okay. I think, um, I think we're good. I wanna just encourage uh, people to go through the chat box. Uh, many people have shared uh, their information. So if anything uh, looks, I know that these chats um, many times, I guess it depends on how fancy your Zoom is, they disappear. So um, if any of this contact information is of interest to you, uh, take a picture of your screen. And um, I, uh, any final words, uh, Michael, before I close? Just one question as if I were a participant. Yes. Where will we find a copy of the presentations? Yes. Well, that was going to be a part of my uh, closing remarks. So this is a perfect segue. Um, thank you very much, Michael, for your um, expertise, uh, your membership, uh, and just your support in the AmCham community and being here today. Uh, we, um, the slides, a copy of the slides, a PDF version will be sent to everyone who registered uh, with their AmCham. And in a few days, uh, a recording of the event will be made available um, and the link will be sent out, um, but you'll receive the, the presentations themselves with all of the um, information and the websites and the names of different organizations you know, in those slides. And if you have any follow-up questions uh, based on that, please reach out to your local AmCham and uh, we'll help you uh, find the resources and the answers that you need. I wanna uh, thank Paula and her team at AmCham Kuwait for organizing this amazing virtual event. And uh, we all look forward to seeing our members in person um, as we move forward and are able to organize those. But one of the silver linings of COVID has been the ability to do these collective uh, events in the region. And I know speaking for all the AmCham's, we just really appreciated the opportunity to come together on these Zoom calls. Um, so for all the participating AmCham's, Abu Dhabi, Bahrain, Dubai, Kuwait, Oman, and Qatar, we look forward to seeing our members at upcoming events. And we invite all non-members to learn more about the benefits of AmCham membership. So please get in touch with us. And uh, as I said, you'll be receiving a copy of the presentation. And I wish everyone a good day ahead. And uh, we look forward to seeing you soon. Bye.